Note from Crane's Bill. As of the posting of this chapter, it's officially been one whole year since I started writing Naruto Karyutam. I want to thank everyone who's read a year's worth of sloppy fanfiction. I hope you've enjoyed it so far and will continue to enjoy it as I hopefully improve as a writer. Chapter 73 Hidden Moon Part 1 Sundown A week ago, Aburama household, with Team 5 having received their mission parameters, they've each gone home to prepare for their departure first thing in the morning. Shino is currently sitting by a napping Shichi's crib, quietly looking at his son. When Shiho eventually walks past, she jumps in her spot from the surprise presence in Shichi's room and lets out a quiet squeak. She just barely manages to hold onto the book she's holding. Shino, you're back. She takes deep breaths. I thought you went on a mission. Shino nods and speaks in a hushed tone. I received it, but we leave tomorrow. He looks back to his wife. I didn't mean to startle you, I'm sorry. No, it's fine, I just wasn't expecting you back. Shino stands up and walks out of the room to not disturb the sleeping babe. The two proud parents take one last peek before they close the door. Shiho lifts herself up on her toes to kiss him on the cheek. So what's your mission? The two of them walk to the room right next to Shichi's, which also happens to be Shiho's office. A diplomatic one. We're to go to the Hidden Moon Village and negotiate on behalf of the Shinobi Union. Shiho raises a brow. But you're not a diplomat. I mean, I think you'd be a good one, but it's not your job, is it? She sits down on a couch in the corner and places her book on the table. He takes a seat next to her. Perhaps not usually, but the purpose is to showcase the best and brightest we have, the ones who will eventually come to lead the Shinobi Union. My Team 5 just happens to be that. Shino states matter-of-factly. Shiho chuckles. Such confidence in yourself. Not in myself. Shino shakes his head. In them. Although they may not realize how important they'll be to the Hidden Leaf's future, that's because they still have their childhoods to live out. You think they'll actually get to that point? It's my responsibility to ensure they do. Are, at the very least, ensure they have that path before them. Whether they take it is entirely up to them. Kashiwama and Genzai have sense of duty instilled in them from being the sons of their clan's heads, and while Jiriki may not have that, he still has a lot of faith put in him by the Hyuga. You've even said he's compared to that Neji Hyuga. He is, but he still has a way to go. He's smart and capable like Neji was at his age, but I think he still lacks the same driving force that Neji had. Not that Neji's driving force was from a good place. Shiho winces. I'm sorry, I know I shouldn't speak ill of the dead. No, you're correct. He may not have started with good intentions, but he turned it around. If I can help him find that something, besides his rivalry with Team 9's Shoto Teshin, I'm sure if someone can, it's you. Shiho leans on his shoulder. Thank you. Shino rests his head on top of Shiho's and looks at the unmarked book that she'd take in. Is this work related? Hmm? Oh, this? Yes, Matoku sent some things he asked me to look into, some coded messages from escaped convicts. It's taking a while. She sighs. Shino chuckles. Well, I'm sure if someone can decode them, it's you. Shiho laughs. Thanks. I don't want to disturb your work. I'll go put Shichi back to sleep. Shiho raises a brow. But he's already. A cry from the next room interrupts her mid-sentence. Shiho looks between her husband and the wall behind her with a confused look. Shino lifts his finger to show a single tiny beetle on his fingertip. I left behind a kakechu to watch over him. I'll most likely be gone a while for my mission. I promise to make up for my absence. He then turns around and goes to check on his son. Shiho simply smiles at her husband's thoughtfulness and diligence and goes back to work as the crying from Shichi's room subsides. Send you household. Kashiwama spends his day in a rather relaxed manner. Rather than training or doing something more physical, he's spending his time baking. He's hard at work crafting his specialty wagashi, confections usually served with tea. He's hard at work decorating each of the sugary delights in bright colors, while one man sits at the kitchen counter and observes. So, whatcha think, dad? Kashiwama asks in anticipation. His dad takes one of the wagashi and closely inspects them before taking a small bite of the already small treat. He hums and gives an approving nod. It's really good. You've gotten better at this. Kashiwama grins, right? It's gonna knock him out. It sure will. Shoji. The man turns around at his name being called out from the other room. The door to the kitchen opens to reveal Fusuma walking in and looking around. Have you seen? She stops when she finds who she's looking for. There you are, Kashiwama. What are you doing? 
she asks as she takes a seat next to her husband. Baking, Fusuma laughs. I can see that, but why? And why so many? It's training for my next mission. Kashiwama answers. Apparently he wants to wow the hidden moon with not just his skills as a shinobi, but also as a baker. Shoji clarifies. I did hear you got a pretty important mission. So this is your battle plan, huh? Yep. Kashiwama starts munching on the wagashi. I heard the hidden moon's real welcoming to outsiders, so sharing cultures is a good way to win them over. Shoji raises a brow. Is that true? I'll be honest, I've not really heard much of the hidden moon. Fusuma shrugs. They usually keep to themselves, but it's true they differ greatly from other hidden villages. They've been somewhat of a neutral zone in past conflicts. It's probably one of the easier villages to negotiate with. Still, I doubt that means it'll be a simple task. Kashiwama nods. Shino-sensei warned us. Just because they're a peaceful village doesn't mean they'll want to join the union. My, my, aren't you the sensible one? Fusuma chuckles. It feels like only yesterday that you were running around shouting about how much you want to learn ninjutsu, and now look at you. Already entrusted with such mission. Kashiwama blushes and sinks down behind the counter. Mom, he whines in embarrassment. Now it's only a matter of time before he marries that Katori girl and becomes head of the clan. Shoji adds to his son's embarrassment. Kashiwama grumbles. Not like that's going to happen. Katori isn't really interested in that, so... He stands up with an attempt of a smile on his face. Oh, Shoji raises a brow. Even though you were so concerned about her when she came to the village, so determined to help her find her place. You're just giving up on her now? Ah, I don't want to talk about it. Kashiwama screams and speed walks to the door. I'm going to train. He makes a very hasty and abrupt exit. I think we went too far, dear. Fusuma chuckles. Looks like the kids still have a lot of things to figure out, huh? Shoji joins her in their shared amusement. Feels like such a simpler time. Even though you were pretty awkward, too. Fusuma pats him on the back. I was most certainly not. Shoji protests. I was a dashing rogue, that's why you fell in love with me. Yeah, sure. Saratobi household. Genzai's having a bit more trouble with his pre-mission day afternoon. He's currently running through the clear and open space of the Saratobi clan's compound in a desperate chase with two particularly annoying monkeys. The mischievous brother and sister duo, Enki and Enka, are giving him a run for his money. You're gonna have to try harder. Enki smacks his butt in Genzai's face before he zooms away. Enka sticks out her tongue while running backward through the treetops. Hurry up, Slopuk. Genzai stops running for a moment to catch his breath. He leans on a tree as he pants from the chase. How are they so fast? Speed's never been an issue for me and yet. A chuckle from directly above interrupts his rest. Two chuckles, actually. Genzai looks up to see his older brother Kanohimaru and his own summons, Enra, leaning over his shoulder. Having a hard time? Kanohimaru asks. I have it handled. Genzai straightens himself and brushes away his sweaty brow with his sleeve. Just need a break, is all. Enra hops down to a lower branch and hangs upside down. Boy, you sure got the short straw when those two answered your summons. You sure you don't want a refund? I'm fine. Genzai begins making his way toward where he last saw Enki and Enka. Kanohimaru swoops down and grabs his little brother around the stomach and carries him over the shoulder. What are you doing? Genzai demands. You're not going to get anywhere like this. You're a smart one. You should know it's useless to just chase after them. But we have to start working as a team. We leave for our mission tomorrow, and if I can't even get my own summons to cooperate, then think about how you can accomplish that. Running around is their specialty, so you shouldn't play on their turf. Drag them to yours. Easy for you to say. Gen's eye grumbles. Ugh, listen, there's no shame in admitting you can't do something. Enra hops on Genzai's back while the boy is being carried on Kanohimaru's shoulder. I can totally do it. I just need to trap them somehow. Then do just that. Once you rest up, Kanohimaru drops his younger brother next to a boulder and hands him a bottle of water. Enra hops on the boulder above Genzai. Fine. Genzai snatches the bottle and takes a big swig. Easy there. It's not good to drink too much at once. It's then that the two brothers see their parents, Tasaku and Akusa Saratobi, walking toward them, along with a figure that Genzai has never actually seen, and Kanohimaru hasn't seen in many years now. The towering form of the Monkey King Enma, here is in Saratobi's lifelong companion. Tasaku beckons for Kanohimaru to come to them. Kanohimaru and Genzai exchange a confused look, but the older brother leaves his young sibling alone to rest while he checks out what's happening. Hello Kanohimaru, Enma smiles at the boy as he approaches. 
It's been a while, hasn't it? Indeed, it has. Konohamaru firmly shakes the Monkey King's hand. Is something wrong? For you to come all the way here? Well, it's not really wrong per se. Enma scratches his fuzzy chin. Tosaku shakes his head. This is a mistake. Ikusa nudges her husband with an elbow. That's for him to decide. Konohamaru's now even more confused. Enma sighs and reaches behind himself to take off a sheathed sword from its strap. He holds the blade in front of himself and, unprompted, the sword flies out of its sheath and stands at the ready by Enma's side. That's a neat trick. I didn't know you had telekinesis. I don't, Enma says. That's the sword itself responding to me. The blade flies back into its sheath and Enma holds out the hilt to Konohamaru. Just as he's about to take it, Enma continues to speak. This is Arachimaru's sword, Kusanagi, that he killed Hiruzen with. Konohamaru stops in his tracks as his hand begins to tremble, mere centimeters away from grabbing the hilt. He eyes the sword with a great apprehension before looking up to Enma with a cold expression. Why are you showing this to me? I've been holding on to this since Hiruzen died, wondering what I'm even supposed to do with it. You've grown into a splendid shinobi, you're now, what, 18? I turn 19 this year. Konohamaru corrects him. How time flies. Enma smiles. This is a powerful weapon that can even rival our adamantine form. It's a waste for it to stay with me. If you'd use it, it's yours. Konohamaru grits his teeth. And why exactly would I use the sword that killed my grandpa? You shouldn't. Tosaku answers. It's a vile thing that has no place in the Saratobi clan. It's a mere weapon. Ikusa retorts. It's neither vile nor is it good, but it's been used by many shinobi over the centuries. Just because Arachimaru so happened to be the last person to wield it shouldn't condemn it to waste away. I don't know if I can take this. Not now. Konohamaru lowers his head. Ikusa places a comforting hand on his shoulder. Konohamaru. He places a hand over his hers. I know you're right, mom. I just can't. He turns around and begins slowly walking back to his brother. I have to help Genzai with Enki and Enka. I'll think about it. Enma places the blade on his back again. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cause this pain to resurface. You've done nothing wrong, Enma. Ikusa reassures him. Just give him time. With a bow, Enma disappears back home. I still don't like it. Tosaku continues to grumble. Father wouldn't approve of this. Your father would definitely approve of this. He was never one to think ill of another, even someone like Arachimaru. Ikusa reminds him of Hiruzen's belief in the good of people. Tosaku sighs. Maybe you're right. I always am. She smirks. He laughs and shakes his head. Don't you have a mission to go to? Ikusa playfully holds her finger up to her lips. You're no longer Anbu, remember? You're not supposed to know about it. Tosaku grabs a small pebble and flings it at a seemingly random tree, behind which two members of the Anbu are waiting. Then your squad should do a better job of hiding. Don't be a show-off, dear. Ikusa kisses him on the cheek and disappears along with her squadmates. Over to the side, Genzai eyes his returning brother and the sour mood he seems to be in. Did something bad happen? Konohamaru puts on a smile and ruffles his hair. It's all good. Nothing you need to worry about. Genzai narrows his eyes. That's usually said about things that need worrying about. For now you just have to focus on getting Enki and Enka to listen, okay? We'll deal with other stuff later. Sure. Genzai apprehensively agrees to let it go. Yuga Household Jiriki has taken to a more standard use of his free time. Training. He's his Byakugan activated and a bow in his hands. He's currently in the process of dodging blows by a man with short hair and a woman with shoulder-length hair tied in a ponytail, both wearing standard gray kimonos of their clan. His father, Tabashi, and his mother, Sayu. The two each take turns in trying to distract their son with their gentle fist, while Jiriki tries to shoot his arrows at nearby targets. If one is trying to distract him, the other is trying to intercept the arrows. Jiriki does his best to outmaneuver his parents and get his arrows to stick, but even though he has his Byakugan, he still falls short. During one instance, Jiriki jumps back and sloppily pulls on the bowstring, sending the arrow wide. Tabashi still manages to catch it, but decides this is enough. This is it for now. He slowly walks over to his son and wife. I can keep going. Jiriki says as he tries to stand on his shaky legs, clearly unable to keep going. Tusu brushes her son's hair. Don't strain your body, Jiriki. You need to be in shape tomorrow, not tired. A fourth figure appears besides them, long flowing hair taking its time to fall down as she lands. They're right, you know. Hanabi smiles. Lady Hanabi. Tabashi and Sayu take a deep bow. 
I wasn't aware you were here, my deepest apologies. Hanabi nervously holds out her arms. There's no need to go that far. I wanted to check up on Juriki and didn't want to interrupt your training. On me? Juriki wonders. Am I needed for something? Well, not here, but you've got an important mission tomorrow, don't you? Not everyone gets picked for this kind of thing. We're grateful for you watching over our Juriki. Sayu says. Even though we're from a branch family and neither of us have the Byakugan, you've shown great kindness to us and our son. Well, that kind of thing doesn't matter anymore. Hanabi says. If someone has talent, it should be nurtured, no matter what branch of the tree they're on. A valuable lesson Neji left behind for us all. And his sacrifice won't go forgotten. We'll all make sure of that. Tabashi gives a firm nod. So how are you feeling about the mission? Hanabi asks Juriki. If Lady Hakage's entrusted us with this, then that must mean we're properly equipped to handle it. I know Team 5 has what it takes. He declares. Such confidence. Hanabi chuckles and leans down to be closer to him. Just don't put any unnecessary stress on yourself, okay? Juriki cocks his head. Meaning? Don't feel like you're somehow representing the whole village or even clan when you go. Just do your best to be yourself and show off what you can do. It's easy with these kinds of missions to overthink and blunder in a way you normally wouldn't. Trust in Shino-sensei to handle the heavy lifting while you three do your thing. Juriki scratches his head. But I thought I am representing the village and the clan. Hanabi shakes her head. You're representing yourself as the future of the village, so just focus on that. Ill. Try? He sounds utterly confused. Good. Hanabi hops back to straighten herself and turns to Tabashi and Sayu. You've raised him into a fine man. You should be very proud. They both take another deep bow. Thank you, and for your words of wisdom. Is that what those were? Juriki thinks to himself. Before she goes, Hanabi looks back and winks at Juriki. Don't be afraid to relax, okay? With those words, she flickers away. Juriki, Tabashi's tone comes off a bit more stern than he probably intended, be sure to show Lady Hanabi proper appreciation, understand? Lord Hiashi and Lady Hanabi have done much for us. Sayu reminds him. Even if it's a simple thank you, you should express it clearly. I will. Juriki responds. Sayu smiles and hugs him. Now, let's go eat. Tabashi rubs his tummy. Oh, I'm starving. You must have worked up an appetite, too, huh? He looks at his son. I'm not that hungry. He says just before his stomach growls. His cheeks turn red and he immediately looks away. Tabashi and Sayu laugh. Whatever you want to eat, consider it done. Sayu offers. Juriki grumbles. Yakitori, then Yakitori it is. Hidden Leaf Village Main Gate The following morning, Shino awaits his students by the main gate, himself being early as usual. He stands still and unmoving by the large entrance to the point where the guards manning the entrance begin to wonder if he'd fallen asleep on his feet. They even make a small bet amongst each other. One of them loses when Shino finally moves after a few solid minutes of nothing, when Team 5 appear pretty much at the same time from different directions. Shino looks at his watch. Precisely the time we agreed upon. Well done. Yes, sensei. They say in unison. Before we depart, are there any burning questions about our mission? Shino asks as he looks the three of them over. Juriki raises his hand after a moment of consideration. Um, Shino-sensei, what precisely is our purpose on this mission? He motions to himself, Kashiwama, and Genzai. Shino nods. I'm glad you asked. You're to show yourself as the bright future of our village. You may end up being assigned tasks to complete alongside your fellow shinobi from the Hidden Moon. In such cases, you're to show the ability to cooperate and willingness to learn from them. So we're just going to do what we usually do? Kashiwama raises a brow. In a certain sense, yes. By working closely with the Hidden Moon, you're to show yourselves as shinobi willing to work together with others to preserve the peace we've built. What about you, sensei? Won't you be doing these assignments with us? Genzai asks. No, I will not. My duties will be a bit more administrative. You will be on your own for most of our stay. I trust that won't be an issue. No, sensei. They once again say in unison. Good. Now let's depart. That's because Team 9 has already left and we can't allow ourselves to lag behind. All right, let's go. Kashiwama speeds off. Genzai and Juriki both sigh, but follow him. Shino smiles at his students' enthusiasm and goes after them. Name meanings, Shoji Senju. Named after translucent sliding doors found in traditional Japanese households, they allow light in as opposed to the opaque Fusuma sliding doors. Akusa Saratobi, War or Battle.
Tabashi Yuga, Lighter Lamp. Sayu Yuga, Do. End of Chapter 73. Chapter 74, Hidden Moon Part 2, Crescent Moon. The trip itself doesn't take long. The Hidden Moon Village is located in a land directly south of the Land of Fire, meaning they're by far the closest Union member to them. Their travel is not met by any obstacles, difficulties, or roadblocks. They enjoy a very mundane trek through the country. During one of their last breaks before reaching their destination, Shino makes sure to remind his team of the situation. Remember, he stands up to address the Genin. The Hidden Moon Village doesn't operate on the same rules as other villages you may be familiar with. For one, their borders are open to anyone thanks to their open-door policy. They're a neutral zone. Jiriki raises a brow. If they're neutral, then why are they joining the Union? Isn't that taking a side? Shino nods in acknowledgement of the question. I can't speak for their reason, not yet at least, but it's possible they recognize the change that's coming to the world. Whether that's the case, it's my mission to find out. Genzai raises his hand. What about their ranking system? The mission report left it kinda vague. Yeah, I didn't really get it, either. Kashiwama scratches his head. It's true that they don't follow the same system that we do. They're somewhat more loose in their training of young shinobi. However, I don't want to mistakenly paint you the wrong picture, which is why it's best for you to learn how they do things at the village itself. So there are things even sensei doesn't know? Kashiwama asks. Of course. Anyone who tells you they know everything is a liar. Now, let's depart, we've only a day's travel ahead. With that bit of wisdom, Team 5 gather up their belongings into their packs and storage scrolls and continue to their destination. Hidden Moon Village When Team 5 approach the Hidden Moon, their attention is immediately drawn to the centerpiece of the village. A large tower-like structure, seemingly carved into a very tall tower of stone that looms over the village. From a distance it looks like there are multiple buildings built into the large natural structure, with it most likely serving as the main headquarters of the village. They do tend to be built in the most prominent buildings. As they make their way down a cliff, they do get a view of the rest of the village, with it being apparently very traditional in appearance. Buildings like these are ones you'd find the old clans living in, as all the clans of Team 5, as opposed to the newer structure in the Hidden Leaf. They walk the road undisturbed until the front gates of the Hidden Moon finally come into clear view. Even from a distance, they can already see a gathering of people, waiting to greet them into the village. When they finally reach the foreign village, a single young woman walks out to greet them while the rest stay back. The most noticeable feature is the stark contrast between her darker skin and silver hair, further contrasted by her emerald eyes that go with her turquoise kimono. She gives a deep bow when her guests arrive. Shinobi of the Hidden Leaf Village, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Hidden Moon Village. I am the village head, Tsukino. Shino returns the bow. My name is Shino Aburama, Jonin leader of Team 5. He motions to the three genin behind him. These are my charges. Kashiwama Senju, Genzai Saratobi, and Jiriki Hyuga. The boys bow. A warm smile crosses Tsukino's lips. All names respected and cursed throughout the battlefields of old. The path ahead won't be easy for you, but I hope you walk it with confidence. Thank you ma'am. Please, come right this way. I hope you find our village as welcome as home. Tsukino ushers them past the gates. They're immediately greeted by a woman holding out a plate with four small cups of tea, while a man beside her holds a plate with colorful wagashi, all brightly decorated and shaped to resemble flowers. Kashiwama is immediately drawn to the confection. Ooh, these look good. He looks over the plate with an appraising eye. Are the peach flavored? He looks up to the man. Don't forget your manners. Genzai chuckles. The man holding the plate chuckles. You've a good nose. These are indeed peach flavored. Tsukino motions to the tea and wagashi. A small sample of our hospitality, as a welcoming gift. Thank you kindly. Shino takes a sip of the small cup of the tea and takes a sweet. The boys do the same. Kashiwama stuffs the whole wagashi in his mouth. Oh, this is tasty. He says with a mouthful of wagashi. You guys gotta try it. We are. Jiriki takes a smaller, more measured bite than his friend. You're forgetting your manners. Genzai takes a small bite, as well. Shino looks over the small gathering present to greet them before turning his attention back to the village head. It's quite the gathering just to greet us. You're important guests. Tsukino smiles. This is also a turning point for our village, so everyone was eager to see who would arrive. Although I doubt eagerness is the only thing they feel. Shino says in a quieter voice. Tsukino's smile becomes strained for only a moment before she regains her composure. 
Yes, well, that's something for us to discuss in private, isn't it? Indeed. Shino nods. Why don't I show you your quarters? Tsukino invites them to come with her further into the village. They pass by the crowd that had gathered and make their way, but not before Kashiwama gives an appreciative bow to the two who presented them with the tea and wagashi. The moon itself is definitely much smaller than the leaf with smaller houses and less apartment complexes, but it seems to be enough for the people here. They seem to be headed for the large structure that towers over every other. Is this where we're going? Kashiwama asks. We are. Tsukino nods. This is the moon touch tower. At the very top are the offices, including my own, and at the bottom are special accommodations for important guests. That's where you'll be staying. So it serves multiple purposes. Is there no fear of having outsiders so close to these offices? I presume they hold valuable information concerning the village. Tsukino chuckles at the thought. Our guests respect our neutrality and don't violate our trust. We've been safe from such incidents since the shinobi villages were first founded, so it's a system that served us well. Jiriki and Genzai share a discredulous look. Not one incident, really? Kashiwama doesn't seem to have any issues believing that as he strolls along and admires the scenery, which becomes even more impressive as they get closer to the tower. Somehow it feels even more impressive close up. Tsukino continues her explanation. Around the tower are some of the most important facilities, such as the school and hospital. It's all kept centralized in this spot. She leads them up a flight of stairs that lead into the massive moon touch tower until they reach a particular door to an apartment built into the stone structure. This is where you'll stay for the duration of your visit. It's fully equipped and stocked, and it has four separate rooms for each of you. If anything's lacking, you can inform my secretary. And where might we find your secretary? Shino asks. We'll meet her in a moment. Rather than checking out the apartment first, Tsukino leads them on a tour of the upper part of the Moon Touch Tower. They're not shown every single room in and out, but they're informed what's where, or at least the things they're allowed to know about. Offices, Messenger Falcon Room, and Tsukino's personal office. There, they meet a young woman with short black hair and a more practical kimono for someone who's presumably a shinobi. Yuzara, these are our guests from the Hidden Leaf. Shino Aburama, Genzai Saratobi, Jiriki Hyuga, and Kashiwama Senju. It's a pleasure. Yuzara gives a bow which Team 5 return. Ours, as well. Shino responds. If you have any questions, she has the answers. Yuzara gives a nervous laugh. I don't know if I'm that capable, but I'll certainly try to answer. Yuzara, could you call Tambo to the top? We'll meet him there. Tsukino requests. Yes ma'am. Meanwhile, why don't we go to the top? Tsukino leads them out of the room. While she does, the secretary Yuzara takes a radio to summon this tambo to the tower. When Tsukino said the top, she did mean the literal top. The highest point of the tower sits behind a door that is sealed with a series of tags and jutsu formulae scattered across the walls. Tsukino forms the necessary hand signs to temporarily loosen the barrier so they can all enter through the door. Jiriki raises a brow. What's so important up here that you'd keep it behind a barrier? You'll see in a moment. Tsukino looks back with a mischievous smile before going in through the door. There, at the very tip of the moon touch tower, they're met by an unexpected sight. The very top is a garden in its own right, with rows of colorful and beautiful flowers lining the green areas, and well-kept and trimmed bushes acting as a natural fence. The centerpiece and really the first thing to catch one's eye in this garden is an oddly mystical pure white tree. The bare base of it is easily several times taller than an average human and has a thick woven rope tied around it, with several bolt-shaped paper strips hanging from it. At around the middle of the tree's massive height, the branches begin forming out, and its white color is almost hidden by its green needle-like leaves. This is our sacred tree, the Gashinboku. Tsukino motions to the large evergreen. Upon seeing it, Jiriki's immediate first instinct is to focus his chakra to his eyes and look to the edge of the platform. By Akugin, he sees nothing. It's like the world ends at the edge of the roof. You're quick to grasp. Shino notes. Your instinct is correct. We saw no trace of this tree when we looked at the tower from the outside. Oh. Kashiwama looks around. Now that you mention it. It's true. Even if the tower is tall, a tree this big would have been visible. Tsukino nods. That's one of the functions of the barrier we passed. It serves to protect a tree that my clan has been tasked with protecting for centuries. This tree? Genzai cocks his head. Why is it special? Kashiwama takes slow steps forward, burning his eyes into the tree with a focus he doesn't always show. He analyzes and studies the Gashinboku. It's not going to steal our chakra, is it? Jiriki makes a grim joke in reference to the last special tree the shinobi world encountered. Jiriki. 
Shino reminds the boy to behave in a stern voice. I'm sorry, sensei. Jiriki bows his head. What is it? Kashiwama finally asks, his furrow brow still pointed at the tree. It looks like a pine tree, but looking at it, its branches are more like an ash tree, and its leaves are more like a yuz. It's not like any tree I've ever heard of. You've sharp eyes. Tsukino notes. I'm the heir of the Senju clan of the forest, this is the least I should know. You are correct that it's unlike any tree we know of. Whatever it is, it holds many mystical properties and holds many more that we're yet to learn. That is partly why we agreed to negotiate with the Shinobi Union. I've heard tales of the hidden moon, Shino steps closer, you produce a special perfume that's said to be able to negate even the most powerful Genjutsu. I presume the source of that is this Gushinboku? That's correct. Its sap carries a very strong smell that we've tried to utilize as best as we can. It even has mild restorative properties. Whatever we cut from it, it grows back much faster than normal trees. I can see. Jiriki cocks his head in confusion. I think I see something like chakra running through it, Shino looks back at his student. Can you not see it clearly? No, it's a little. Muddled. I need to really focus to see it. Muddled. Shino ponders, for chakra to be hidden to the Byakugan, that means there's something else at play. Hinata mentioned something I believe. He tries to recall. During her travels to the land of wind, she saw chakra muddled when it was mixed with a strong source of natural energy. Yes, that is part of why it holds special power. We wish the aid of the union, but we don't want to see the tree exploited beyond what it can handle. It's not just a resource to us. I hope you can understand that, Shino Aburama. She looks at him with a sterner gaze than he has until now. He's learned to read people fairly well over the years, and there's one thing he can tell from Tsukino's gaze. There's something she isn't telling just yet. There's something more to her tale than she's saying right now, something that will require privacy. Shino nods. I do. Excellent. She smiles. And I do believe we've more guests. She looks behind Team 5, to the entrance of the uppermost platform. From there, two people enter the garden, an older man and a young girl seemingly not older than the Genin of Team 5. They both wear kimono fit for battle with dark armor over it, their appearance not too dissimilar to Tsukino's. This might just be the standard uniform for the Hidden Moon Village. These are? Shino wonders. While you and I discuss matters, Shino Aburama, your pupils will be left in the care of this man to perform missions together. The two newcomers walk up to them and both give a light bow. My name is Tambo Sujibashi, and this is my niece and pupil, Hifumi Sujibashi. It's nice to meet you. Hifumi adds. I'm Shino Aburama, Jonin leader of Team 5. I'm Kashiwama. He strikes a pose of energetically pointing to himself with a thumb. Genzai Saratobi. He bows. Jiriki Hyuga. Tambo is an experienced shinobi, an equivalent to your Jonin. Tsukino says. Your team will be in good hands. Jiriki and Genzai give a confused look at the strange wording. Kashiwama smacks his fist into his open palm, full of excitement. So are we gonna have our first mission today? What are we doing? Tambo chuckles. Not quite yet, although I like the enthusiasm. You'll head out as a five-man cell tomorrow. I just wanted you to meet today. Tsukino clarifies. Can't we go now? Hifumi pleads as she looks between her uncle and the village head. There's so much we can do. Tambo chuckles and pats her on the head. We have plenty of time. Hifumi pouts and brushes her hair back to its original state, not in front of everyone. She mumbles. Tambo gives the Genin an appraising look. I've been told you're some of the best of your generation, the cream of the crop. I'm looking forward to what you can do. You won't be disappointed, trust me. Kashiwama grins. Shino bows his head to his fellow sensei. They're indeed capable, but they've still much to learn. I hope they measure up to your standards. I resent that. Jiriki looks up to his sensei. I'm sure they will. Tambo smiles at Shino. We have a few requests that need fulfilling, so they'll have plenty to do, don't you worry. Hifumi taps her chin with her finger. Then if we're not doing anything today, how about a tour? She asks with a heightened excitement at the end. You just got here, right? There's plenty of cool stuff to see. Yeah, I'm game. Kashiwama jumps at the opportunity. Wacha say, guys? He looks back to his friends. Jiriki waves off the offer. I think I'll pass. Genzai stretches. We'll have plenty of time to look around after we rest. Aw, oh, you guys are no fun. Kashiwama pouts. And rude. How are you not tired from the trip? Jiriki asks. Because there's so much to see. No time to be tired. Kashiwama hops forward toward Hifumi. Don't mind them, they're just grumpy. That's fine. Hifumi puts on a smile. 
She wonders if she'd done or said something in their minimal encounter to upset the other two. It wouldn't look good if they're not on good terms barely 10 minutes in. I'll tell your mom and dad you might be a while. Tambo says before turning to Tsukino and Shino. If there's anything else, I'm always available. Thank you Tambo. Tsukino nods her head, signaling him he's free to take his leave. Come on, I wanna see everything. Kashiwama runs ahead. There's not much to see, though. I wouldn't get your hopes up. Hifumi warns him. Shino turns to his remaining two students. You two be sure to rest well. You're not coming with, Shino-sensei? Genzai asks. Not yet. I'd like to see more of this sacred tree. He looks back to the tree, although his eyes wander to Tsukino herself. The actual reason he wants to stay. Although no one actually sees that because of his sunglasses. With Tambo going home, Genzai and Jiriki going to their apartment, and Kashiwama and Hifumi going to explore, Shino and Tsukino remain alone at the garden in front of the Gashinboku. After a slightly awkward pause, Shino speaks up. I don't like beating around the bush unless absolutely necessary. That's because if we're going to be allies, we need to know where we stand. I agree. So then, what didn't you tell us about the tree? Was I that easy to read? She sighs and hangs her head. It's no fault of your own. Shino reassures her. I've just made it a habit to study people. It's a useful tool. Well, your skills haven't led you astray. You're right, there's more to it. Tsukino turns around to look at the sacred tree in all its glory. I suppose I don't need to tell you what happened six years ago when those roots emerged from the ground. Shino nods. We were at ground zero when it happened. The divine tree threatened to steal the chakra from every person on the planet. Yes, well, except that didn't happen here. Shino takes a moment to process the unbelievable sentence he just heard. I'll need an explanation to believe something like that. There wasn't a single populated place that wasn't overturned by the divine tree's roots. The hidden moon wasn't. Tsukino walks over to the sacred tree and runs her hand across the trunk. When those roots appeared, the Gashinboku reacted in some way. Its trunk glue with a white light and the roots just withered away before they could do anything to us. This tree was able to completely overpower the divine tree? This very tree? Shino demands confirmation. Why have we not heard of this? My father wanted to keep it a secret. He feared what the great nations would do if they find out our tree is of a level comparable to something that nearly ended the world. Best case scenario, the Gashinboku would be destroyed or taken away. Worst case scenario, we'd be attacked and slaughtered. We would never. Shino immediately answers. Tsukino looks back with a saddened smile. There's a long history of that happening. History. Things are different now. For now. Yet you're still choosing to trust us with this information after six years of hiding it. Why? My father was adamant about keeping this to ourselves. We would still welcome outsiders with open arms, but this was to be kept top secret, he didn't want any ills to befall us. I tried to carry on these beliefs after he passed but. I've had doubts if that's the best course of action. So you're willing to trust us? I trust that this knowledge could potentially save the world, as it saved us. All that's left is to see if I've made the right choice. She turns her entire body to firmly look him in the. Well, sunglasses. I'll see to it that you have. Are you going to report this to your Hakage? Shino shakes his head. Not yet. As incredible a discovery as this is, I still need to verify it and determine the extent of this Gashinboku's abilities. That's because I'd prefer to offer an informed opinion rather than speculation. You're certainly thorough. It's my assignment, after all, but it can wait until tomorrow. Thank you for your honesty. I'll ensure it's not misplaced. Thank you. Later in the evening, it doesn't really take long for Hifumi to show Kashiwama the points of interest in the Hidden Moon Village. A few shops and stalls, a couple parks, and a temple on the outskirts really make up most of it. Hifumi tried her best to extend the tour and make it seem more interesting, but she really couldn't. They end their walk around the village by getting some sweets and hopping atop the roof of one of the higher towers around the village, a seemingly common practice for shinobi. There's just something about being on a high place that really puts a nice finish to one's day. Sorry there's not much to see. Hifumi gives a nervous chuckle. You kidding? Kashiwama stuffs his face with some dango. It's really cool. There's a lot of spirit and personality here that we don't really have in the leaf. Yeah, but I bet you have more things to do. Hifumi sighs wistfully and rests her chin in her palms. You probably get to go on actual missions, too. You don't? He cocks his head. She shrugs. They're all just chores, really. I'm not trusted with doing bigger missions when we get them. I just want to go on real missions, you know? Prove my worth and be a real shinobi. 
I'm sure they'll realize you can handle it soon enough, sorry, I didn't mean to ramble, you didn't come all the way here to hear me whine. She shrinks back in her seat a little, her cheeks slightly red from embarrassment. No, but we came here so we can work together, and that means becoming friends, and friends share. You have anything to share? What kind of shinobi do you want to be? She asks. The greatest. He declares as he jumps to his feet to strike a pose. I got a lot to live up as the great-grandson of the first Hakage, but I don't plan on giving up. I'll be the strongest and the fastest and have all the jutsu. Hifumi chuckles at his enthusiasm. That sure is a lot. But. Are you really the grandson of the Hakage? That Hashirama send you? Sure am. Wow, I didn't know someone like that was visiting our village. Just let me warn you in advance. My heart's already taken. He says in full seriousness. Hifumi blinks twice before bursting into laughter. I wasn't thinking of that, but I'll try to keep it in mind. I should probably head back soon. See what Genzai and Jiriki have been up to. Say, I didn't. Offend them or anything, right? Nah, don't worry. Jiriki's kinda rude and Genzai goes with his own flow, but they're good friends. I'm sure they'll warm up soon enough. That's good to know. Well, good night Mr. Greatest Shinobi. Until tomorrow. Hifumi stands up to prepare to leave. Until tomorrow. Name meanings. Yuzara. Night sky. Tambo Sujibashi. Tambo equals Tambo rugby. Played in rice fields. Sujibashi equals cedar chopsticks. Hifumi Sujibashi, old Japanese for one, two, three, which the French would take to name their version of rock, paper, scissors, Jifaumi. Goshen Boku, Sacred Tree of Ages. End of chapter 74. Chapter 75, Hidden Moon Part 3, Suspicions and Secrets. The following morning, Team 5 get up bright and early to prepare for the day ahead. Kashiwama, Genzai, and Jiriki weren't really given any concrete directions, they were just told to wait in front of their apartment first thing in the morning. 8 o'clock, to be exact. As soon as they open their front door with time to spare, they're met by the cheery faces of Tambo and Hifumi, who have been charged to be their teammates for their stay. Good morning. Hifumi gives an energetic greeting. Good morning. Kashiwama matches her zeal. I trust you slept well? Tambo looks between the three boys. Yes, sir. They answer in unison. Good, Tambo nods, because we're doing some physical labor today. Actually, what is our mission? Genzai asks. We weren't really briefed. We'll be going to Kofu Town, a couple hours away. They've requested help in their quartz mines, so we'll be tasked with heavy lifting and possible surveying. We'll get all the details on the spot. With your unique talents, I think we might just be the best for this job, don't you think? He gives a bright smile. We do kind of have experience with that. Genzai turns to Jiriki with a light chuckle. Except we caused a cave-in instead of mining. Jiriki chortles. Hopefully there won't be any giant ants this time. He recalls his collapsing of a cave to take down a giant warrior. Whoa, giant ants, you gotta tell me more. Hifumi looks at them with starry eyes. You can swap stories on the road. If we're all set, let's just go. The five of them speed off to Kofu Town, with Tambo taking the lead and Kashiwama sticking close to the front. Along the way, Genzai regales Hifumi with tales of their missions, mostly the interesting stuff like taking on a nest of giant ants, even though Shino-sensei took down the vast majority. Wow. Hifumi wisps in admiration. You guys have had some cool adventurers. Hasn't your team been on any seer rank missions? Genzai asks. Surely you qualify for them. Hifumi gives an embarrassed smile. Uncle Tambo and I haven't really been on any more dangerous missions. Actually, where even is the rest of your team? Jiriki asks, finally joining the conversation. Um, this is it. Hifumi states with a nervous smile. You're looking at it. Jiriki raises a skeptical eyebrow. A two-man cell? That's right. Tambo chimes in from the front. We form our units a bit differently in the Hidden Moon Village. We don't take on a set number of students. I've only taken Hifumi for now, but some take on as many as five. But, how do you complete missions with just the two of you? Genzai asks. We're simply given missions that we're equipped to handle or are paired with other teams. Tambo clarifies. It's how we've done it until now. That sounds pretty awesome. Kashiwama exclaims. You get more personal time and can prove your own strength. Hifumi breathes a sigh of relief that at least someone doesn't think badly of this system. We still have that at home, though. Jiriki shakes his head. Genin training with our sensei and personal training at home. Is it bad? 
How we do things Hifumi hesitantly asks. Kashiwama slows down to their pace and pats her on the shoulder. I think you're doing great. He grins. Tambo only looks back, wondering where his niece's discomfort is coming from. We're getting close. He decides to save that conversation for later. Yes sir. The Genin get back into proper formation for the last stretch of travel. Kofu Town. The Kofu mines are actually located outside of the town itself, so the team makes a direct beeline there. It's a rather wide quarry, with dozens of platforms raised to reach the multiple levels of the mines and make transporting needed equipment up and down more easy. With pulley systems and an elevator-like structure, they're able to get things up and down as needed. At the very base of the quarry are the most cave openings, and that's where there are tracks visible going into them and several minikerts lined up, ready to roll in and transport ores out. At this time, the miners seem to be taking a break, so finding their way shouldn't be a problem. Excuse me. Tambo approaches one of the workers. I'm from the Hidden Moon, I'd like to speak to your foreman. Ah, you're the shinobi we've been waiting for, huh? Good thing you showed up. The man points to one of the upper levels of the quarry, at a man dressed in a bright orange vest, as opposed to the bright yellow everyone else seems to be wearing. That man in orange there? That's our foreman Kakeru. Thank you kindly. Tambo nods and motions for the kids to follow him. The miners whistle in admiration as the five shinobi effortlessly whoosh up the quarry. Now that's a handy skill to have. At the upper level, Tambo approaches the man that was pointed out to him who's in the middle of giving instructions to his miners. Kakeru? Kakeru turns around. Yes, who's asking? I'm Tambo Sujibashi of the Hidden Moon Village, and these are my charges. We're here on your request, I believe. Ah, of course. It's nice to meet you. The two exchange a handshake. I'm glad you've agreed to do this. The mission report didn't actually specify what specifically we'd be doing. We're hoping for a bit more detail so we know what we're meant to do. Kakeru scratches his chin. Well, that's where a bit of a problem lies. Jiriki mutters under his breath. Of course there's a problem. Initially, we just needed some heavy lifting and to use your ninjutsu to expand the caves below, but we ran into a problem. Gas. Wasn't me, I swear. Kashiwama raises his hands in defense. Jiriki face palms. No, I mean poisonous gas. We struck where we shouldn't have and apparently hit a vein. Some of my guys got sick before we realized what happened. It's an absolute mess. I don't suppose you can somehow deal with that, can you? Tambo looks back to the Genin. Well, team, what do you think? Jiriki looks around at the ground beneath him, where the mine entrance is. He focuses for a moment before the veins around his eyes pop. Byakugan. Whoa. Hifumi looks closely. So that's the Huga clan's Byakugan? What can you see? Genzai asks. There's definitely faint traces of poison in the air, but it's manageable at this stage. The source is outside of my range, though. Jiriki answers. Ah, yeah, the vein we hit is further in. Kakeru says, slightly taken aback by the boy's sudden display. Do you believe it'd be possible to block the source of the gas? Tambo asks the foreman. The man just shrugs. If you know of a safe way. We can't use our explosives cause of the gas or the whole place will go off and we'll be back at square one. Oh, oh. Kashiwama raises his hand and jumps with excitement. I can collapse the cavern with my earth style. All right, there we go. Tambo smiles. Hifumi, do you think you'd be able to blow the gas away? Hifumi scratches her head. Maybe? I've never used it like this. There's a first time for everything. Tambo reassures her. I might be able to clear the air as well. Jiriki adds. The foreman then chimes in. You might get better results working with the other shinobi, no? Other shinobi? Tambo raises a brow. That would be us. A voice calls from the side. Two figures approach, both adorned with Hidden Moon Village forehead protectors. One being the clear superior of the duo, a tall man with spiky gray hair and loose dark purple robes. The shorter boy wears a contrasting green attire, with a sleeveless robe top and detached sleeves on his arm, from underneath his hat, orange hair is visible. The man carries himself in a stoic manner while the boy merrily trots forward with his hands behind his head. I pardon the unannounced arrival. The man adds. No, that's quite all right. I just wasn't informed anyone else would be here. It's good to see you Shinga. You as well, Tambo Sujibashi Shinga nods. I don't believe you've met my charge Dashin. Dashin merrily waves. Hello. No, we haven't had the chance. It's good to meet you, Dashin. This is my own charge, Hifumi, and these are our guests from the Shinobi Union Kashiwama Senju, Genzai Saratobi, and Jiriki Hyuga. Kashiwama and Hifumi both eagerly wave back, while Genzai and Jiriki give a more muted greeting. 
We were actually coming back from a mission of our own and stopped in Kofu to rest, which is when we heard of the issues plaguing the mine. I hope we are not overstepping. No, not at all. It's always good to have backup. We will aid in whatever way we can. Sure will. Dashin salutes. Tambo reaches into his pack and takes out a rebreather to place over his mouth. The rest of his team, including the newly arrived Shinga and Dashin do the same. Set your radio to station TG-1012. Tambo instructs them as they all connect their radios to their rebreathes before setting down into the gas-filled caverns. Thankfully, being prepared for any situation is one of the shinobi's creeds, so they carry gear for most any situation. The rebreathers are good for poison and, depending on the attachments, underwater infiltration. For this, hopefully they won't need to venture underwater. With instructions on where exactly the gas leak originated from and with Yuriki's by Akugan keeping a very close eye on the situation, they're good to go. Juriki is able to focus in on the most minor details and, while still having plenty of growth to do, is able to differentiate where the gas is more condensed. Should we clear the air now? Hifumi asks through the radio. Not yet. Tambo says. If we don't deal with the source, whatever we remove will just have more gas take its place. Shinga, Dashin, do you have jutsu that might deal with the remnant gas? Shinga shakes his head. I'm afraid not currently, but I may have a method. Few in jutsu, crafted to seal away dangerous gases. How long would it take you to prepare it? Tambo asks. Perhaps half an hour. Shinga answers. All right, could you begin working on that as soon as we clear the caverns? Shinga nods. Very well. I might be able to do something with my earth style and fire style? Dashin says. Fire style would be far too dangerous, it could set off a massive explosion depending on the kind of gas. Earth style will definitely work well, though. You can work with Kashiwama here to seal off caverns and keep this mess contained. Tambo motions to the young Senju. Roger. Dashin salutes. Kashiwama raises an open palm. We got this. Yeah, we do. Dashin high fives him. Tambo leads them through the caverns with Yuriki now being close enough to be able to confirm that they are indeed going in the right direction. He can clearly see the source of the problem not far away. A cavern that was very clearly abandoned in the middle of work, presumably in a rush to evacuate once the miners discovered the problem. Tambo looks around the cavern and assesses the situation. Juriki, how familiar are you with structural integrity? Familiar enough. Juriki responds. I can instruct Kashiwama and Dashin what to break and what not. Good. Tambo nods. You three find out how to best close this gas leak, while the rest of us carry the equipment back out. With their roles made clear, they get to work. For the collecting team, there's quite a few things to gather. There's carts of ores and rocks that were in the process of being filled that Tambo and Shinga push back to the entrance, being bigger and stronger than their students. Pickaxes, flashlights, protective gear is also strewn about that Genzai and Hifumi carry out. When Tambo and Shinga push out the minikurts outside for the miners to take over, Shinga sits down by the entrance with an empty scroll and an inkwell to begin the process of setting up a seal to specifically target poison gas. Tambo, Hifumi, and Genzai, meanwhile, begin disassembling the cart tracks that lead into the cavern that will be destroyed once the other team has finished their surveying. It takes the better part of half an hour for the cavern to be fully clear of anything that should be buried, just in time for Shinga to finish his scribing and prepare for the main thing. With Yuriki's surveying done, and Kashiwama and Dashin possessing all the necessary information, they know exactly where to collapse for minimum damage to the mine. Tambo goes inside while Genzai, Hifumi, and Shinga wait outside. Tambo-sensei, shouldn't you wait outside, too? Kashiwama asks with a hint of concern. I couldn't possibly. I'm the leader for this mission so I need to be here to get you out on the off chance something goes wrong. With everything set, Kashiwama and Dashin give each other a confirming nod and they act simultaneously. Earth style? Earth wall. Their first order of business. Seal away the chamber that the miners accidentally opened during their work. They created earthen walls beyond what they can even see in an attempt to create new walls to keep the gas in check. Jiriki scans around with his biakugan. All right, I think it worked. Now bring the whole place down. Kashiwama looks back at him. Well, not the whole place, right? You know what I mean. Next, they step completely out of the chamber and form a new set of hand signs. Earth style? Earth lodging destruction. A jutsu created specifically for situations like this, when you need to bring down a cave on someone's head. They localize it to only tear down certain part of the ceiling and bring it crashing down. In mere seconds, the chamber collapses and becomes blocked off with rubble. Juriki scans it once more. 
With the earthen walls created first, a degree of stability was given to the chamber to allow for the rubble to be funneled in a way to better block the dangerous chambers below. Now there's no way for it to get inside the mines. Mission accomplished. Juriki states. All right, Kashiwama jumps from joy. That was also. Dashin laughs. You're certain it's completely blocked off? Tambo asks. Juriki nods. Certain. I know you've already exhausted yourself with the surveying, but you mentioned you could also help with clearing it, correct? Don't worry, I'm still good to go. Tambo nods in confirmation and turns on his radio. Hifumi, Shinga, we're prepared for clearing the gas. Roger that. Shinga responds. The miners who were sitting and waiting outside had a bit of a scare when the tremors hit, but were very pleased to hear the task was successfully done. Shinga enters with his sealing scrolls and places it in a more central position where there's a larger gathering. With a few hand signs, the jutsu formulae begin to glow, and a mark appears in a central empty part of the scroll. Poison sealing method. The poison around him begins to swirl and slowly be sucked into the center of the sealing scroll. From their positions deeper into the corridors, Jiriki and Hifumi act as well. Gathering chakra around his arms, Jiriki thrusts forward to unleash a blast of wind that fills the entire cavern and sends the gas toward Shinga. Eight trigrams. Vacuum palm. On her side, Hifumi takes out a few steel wires lodged between her fingers and sends them out to latch onto the walls. By sending her chakra through them, the wires begin to hum and each give off a whirl of wind chakra. With a flick of her wrists, the wires lash out and whip the air away. Wind style? Sympathetic vibrations. Slowly, Hifumi and Jiriki fan the remaining poison toward Shinga's seal, while the others rest up. They go through each corridor, and when certain parts are free of gas, Shinga moves the scroll to a place that's closer to other pockets of poison. In chambers with a lesser concentration, Hifumi's ability to manipulate her wires proves better at gathering the remaining poison for it to be sealed. After about an hour or so of thorough air manipulation, the three of them exit the mine. The foreman profusely thanks all the shinobi and the miners give a big round of applause for a job excellently done. I can't thank you enough. The foreman says. Man, having these abilities would save us a lot of time. One of the miners says. Think I can become a ninja? Another says in a half joke. You? His friend laughs. As if, Tambo smiles at the miners cheering, but has to give a reminder. That being said, we still actually have to complete the mission we originally came for. Expand the cavern system so you can mine deeper. Oh, right. The foreman rubs his neck in embarrassment, having grown too excited to remember the work still isn't finished. Tambo then turns to the two shinobi who came in unexpectedly. Shinga, Dashin, I can't thank you enough. I don't know what we would have done without your aid. I'm certain you would have found a way, Tambo. Maybe, but your fuinjutsu saved us hours of work. When we return I'll tell Lady Tsukino of your contribution. You're certain you don't need us to stay further? I couldn't possibly ask you to do any more than you've already done. Then we'll take our leave. Shinga nods. The foreman walks up to them and offers an extended hand. Can't let you leave without giving my thanks, too. There's no need. Shinga returns the handshake and turns away to leave. Kashiwama runs up to Dashin and offers a handshake of his own. Hey, you were pretty awesome back there. Maybe we'll get to work together again. Dashin shakes his hand and gives a less cheerful smile than he's given until now. I'm sure we'll meet again. On a hill overlooking Kofu town, Shinga and Dashin look back toward the mine, taking a moment to stop and consider their options. What do you think, Dashin? They're okay. Dashin's lip twist into a comical grin. Do you think the leaf will be a problem? The leaf are usually a problem. Shinga groans in exasperation. We'll need to tread carefully. They didn't have what you need? Dashin asks. Shinga shakes his head. No. Hopefully when our friends open up the mines, they'll find what we're looking for. Sure was nice of them to help us. Dashin cackles. Let's go. We've wasted enough time. With the gas removed, Tambo, Hifumi, and Team 5 are free to finish their actual mission. This one, however, relies greatly on Jiriki once again, with his immensely useful Byakugan. With prior surveying from the miners and his X-ray vision to confirm what they'd found, he can direct Kashiwama to use his earth style to create tunnels and earth walls to strengthen the structures. All the while the rest handle the heavy lifting by carrying equipment inside and extending the tracks to reach further in, so they can get the carts in. It takes the better part of the day, but they ultimately manage to do their mission and do it better than the miners could have expected. While the Genin are out doing their own thing, 
Shino has something of great importance to verify, Tsukino's claims that they were somehow protected from the divine tree's effects by their own sacred tree. He has no reason to doubt her words, since there's not much reason to lie about something to this extent. His ability to judge someone's character might not always be accurate, especially against those trained to keep secrets, but he'd say he has a solid grasp on the village head. He's currently being escorted by Tsukino herself and two other moon shinobi through a series of underground caverns, the entrance of which were just outside the village. So, some roots of the divine tree still remain here? Shino asks for clarification. Tsukino nods. Yes. We destroyed them as much as we can so they're no longer near the surface, but they run deep underground. We'd run into the same issues. No matter how much we destroyed, we never could destroy them fully. It's simply too much work, even for the Abu Rama clan swarm of Kakechu. Do you plan on using them now, as well? She asks. Indeed. Shino nods. My Kakechu have passed on the knowledge of the Divine Tree's composition onto the future generations. I spent the evening breeding more Kakechu under the assumption that your sacred tree and the Divine Tree share similarities, if they're in some ways linked to one another. That's certainly thinking ahead. As I said, I prefer to be thorough with my work. As they walk for a few more minutes through the underground tunnels, they finally reach a wide chamber where the roots of the divine tree are all present. They've been very clearly cut down to a great degree, to place them as far away from the village, while also keeping them close enough to reach for cases such as this. The walls are lined with a series of tags placed at set intervals, as are each of the numerous severed roots that protrude from the ground at around knee height. Each tag also has jutsu formulae that spread from it and across the roots. Shino looks around to inspect the tags put in place. Seals and barriers, I presume set to go off if there's any activity from the roots? You're correct, although I don't know how good they'd do against something that eats chakra, but it's the only measure we really have. It's good to be prepared, if nothing else. Will I be able to work without disrupting the tags? Tsukino motions to the two moon shinobi that are accompanying them. Deactivate them. The two do as instructed, going to each and every tag connected to the closest root. As they do, the formulae rescind back into the tag where they can then safely take it off while Shino works. Shino himself unclips a harness slung over his shoulder and places his gourd on the ground. Before we continue, I'd like to hear your recollection of what happened six years ago. How did the Gashinboku protect the village? Tsukino sighs as she looks over the roots. It all happened so fast. I didn't even see all of it, we pieced it together from what different people saw. Before we could even register what was happening, these roots sprouted from the ground and started wrapping people in these cloth-like leaf things. Before it could grab all of us, the barrier around the Gashinboku shattered and its roots spread across and took over. It bore into the divine tree's roots and apparently drained them of life. Those of us who were wrapped up were freed and that's basically it. We got our bearings, started destroying them, and later found out what actually happened from the five great nations. Shino scratches his chin. So the Gashinboku sprang to life and acted against a divine tree. That's basically it. I'm sorry, I know it's not really much to go on. Tsukino hangs her head. Actually, it gives me exactly the information I need. Shino states. Tsukino looks up to him with a raised brow. How so? You see, during the cleanup process to destroy the roots, we of the Abu Rama clan were a vital part of the process. Our beetles could dig into them and eat them from the inside. Of course, the dormant chakra proved too much for the initial generations, until we could raise beetles immune to its effects, and a single Abu Rama was enough to clean up a single city. Is the chakra somehow important to this? It is. Shino nods in response. The chakra levels of the divine tree became ingrained in my beetle, and that information was in turn transferred to me, and last night I transferred it to this new generation. He takes off the gourd's lid, allowing a swarm of kakechu to fly out. Their buzzing only intensifies once they're free and fill the cavern. With a single gesture on Shino's part, they flightward the root and dig into it. If the divine tree roots didn't in fact hold your people for long, then their residual chakra will be much lower than other places. At the very least, that will be all I need to verify your words. The two moon shinobi immediately skid away from the insects, not wanting to be anywhere near them. Tsukino looks on with awe at the famed Abu Rama clan's command of beetles. That's incredible. To think you're capable of even doing that. It's a talent we've honed for hundreds of years. You too. Tsukino motions to the two shinobi. Release other roots, as well. Yes ma'am. They nod, thankful to have a reason to get even further away from the beetles. I realize this may be too much to ask, Shino speaks with a hint of hesitation, but would you allow me to use my kakechu on the Gashinboku, as well? 
The same way you're using them now? Tsukino asks. In a similar way. Less damaging. That's because. I only intend to send several smaller ones to inspect its chakra and see if it bears any similarities to the divine tree. Tsukino takes a moment to think the idea over. My father would have definitely thrown a fit over this, but. She lets out a deep sigh, very well. This is why I invited the shinobi union, after all. To find out what the Gashinboku is and how it relates to the divine tree. Shino gives an understanding nod. I promise the tree won't be damaged. For the next hour, Shino's Kakechu go through some of the roots to have a bigger sample to work with when comparing the results to those of six years ago. After finishing with each root, the beetles fly out and immediately return to Shino's hand. Tsukino merely watches on as Shino stands completely motionless with a bug on his hand until the bug eventually keels over and falls dead on the floor. Are they supposed to do that? She finally asks. They have a shorter life cycle than average. Even if it's been dormant for years, the divine tree's chakra is powerful, and this generation hasn't built up the resistance for it. Not that they need it for this particular task. So they're doing what they're supposed to? Have you gained any further insight? I have. He nods. I've confirmed your recollection of events. The chakra within these roots is much less potent than in ones found elsewhere. This confirms that these have not fed on as much chakra as they would have if you'd been caught in them as we were. So, now you just need to look at the Gashinboku. I don't yet know how much I can glean from it, but that is the next step, yes. Tsukino turns to her shinobi. Reapply the seals and barriers. I'll escort Shino Aburama back. Yes ma'am. Taking the time to leave the caverns and head back into the village, Tsukino once again leads Shino up the tower to pass by the barrier. Unlike the previous day, there are actually people present now. A dozen what appear to be gardeners currently roam the platform and tend to the various plants and shrubbery, but most attention is given to the Gashinboku. Tsukino did say that the sap has many medicinal and herbal applications, so these must be the ones who extract it from the sacred tree and ensure it's not harmed in the process. Tsukino grabs the attention of one man in particular, calling him over. A moment, please. When the man approaches, she introduces them to each other. Higir, this is Shino Aburama, the representative from the Hidden Leaf. A pleasure to meet you. Higir bows. And this is Higir Kuchinashi, he's the head caretaker of the Gashinboku. Has been since I was a little girl. You, as well. Shino returns the bow. What can I help you with, Lady Tsukino? The caretaker asks. Shino wishes to run some tests of his own on the Gashinboku, to help us in better understanding what we have and what happened six years ago. Higyar freezes in place in a brief state of panic as he looks between his leader and the foreign shinobi. Ah. Tsukino notices his discomfort and reassures him. It's all right, I told him everything. It's why he's here, after all. Yes, of course. The older man breathes a bit more easily now and bows his head. So. How can I help? For this process, I simply need free space to work. I'd also like to ask about the treatment the Gashinboku undergoes. How do you tend to it? Higyar motions for Shino to follow him closer to the tree, explaining as they walk. Well, the soil underneath is specially imported from the land of hot waters. We've found that the Gashinboku responded best to that soil, I assume the hot springs give it special properties that resonated well with it. We also feed it with an extract of herbs, in addition to watering, that bolstered its vitality and gave the most potent sap. Shino cocks his head in curiosity. Why do you speak in the past tense? Ah, the tree has not been in the best condition these past years, it's been producing lesser quality sap. We suspect that the incident six years ago has somehow been steadily weakening it. It's another reason we decided to call upon the shinobi union. Tsukino adds. I see. When they reach the tree, Higyar approaches a man kneeling at the base, pouring some sort of green liquid directly onto the roots. He has his head down causing his face to be hidden by his silky blonde hair. When they get close, the man does not look up. Hakui, Higyar addresses the man, could I have one of the samples to show our guest? Yes sir. Hakui responds without looking up. He places the vial he was using next to him and takes out a second vial of green liquid which he passes on to Higyar. Higyar laughs. Come now, you don't need to be shy in front of guests. Over the years, Shino's picked up on a few skills. Being a person who stays back in social interactions, often not by his own choice, he's taken to observing how people interact. The person in front of him has his head low, and at a glance, he could be a naturally reserved individual who's too shy to interact. Shino, however, sees things differently. Hakui is keeping his head low not out of shyness, he just doesn't want to be seen. 
his demeanor and body language isn't that of a shy individual like he's seen plenty of times in Hinata. Shino takes a mental note of everything around him. The clothes, the gear, the vials, the liquid. The liquid. This is what we nurture it with. Higure hands the liquid to Shino which snaps him out of his observations. Thank you. Shino takes it after a second to gather himself again. Hakui quickly gathers his things and makes his way to leave. I'll give you room to work. He says in a quiet voice as he bows to Higure, head still kept low. With a bit of effort, Shino manages to catch a glimpse of Hakui's face underneath the long hair, just as the man leaves. Setting that aside for now, Shino sends out one of his beetles to go into the vial and take a sip of the concoction they feed their sacred tree. Is knowing this process vital for your research? Higure asks. Shino nods. Knowing what the tree is treated with will help me better discern its condition and its properties. He lifts the liquid to his nose and takes a whiff. It's different from what we use in the hidden leaf to treat our trees. We've had to do much experimenting over the years to find what works best with the Gashinboku. We've imported herbs from all over the lands to find the right combination. Yet it's been proving less effective as of late, correct? Sadly, yes. Higure hangs his head. We're yet to find a way to restore it. Just as before, Shino places his gourd on the ground and opens the lid. A much smaller swarm flies out and heads right for the trees. Most of them remain on the surface, clinging onto the bark and leaves, while a select few bore into the tree itself. Higure's jaw drops when he sees the tree abruptly assaulted by insects. The sacred tree. It's perfectly all right. Shino reassures him. My kikachu won't cause any permanent damage. They know how to maneuver to leave minimal traces of their presence and allow it to heal. But, it's not in the. Higure tries to protest until Tsukino places a hand on his shoulder. If anyone would know how to do it, it's one of the hidden leaf. Trust in our new allies, Higure. The process actually takes well over an hour to do. Shino would remain standing for the entire time, while Tsukino and Higure decide to sit down at some point to observe the process. From time to time, the Kakechu re-emerge from the tree and land on Shino's hand, which Tsukino learned is how they transfer information to their host. They begin to somewhat admire Shino's ability to stand perfectly still and not show any signs of boredom or tiredness, especially when it's not even really needed. After a very slow hour, Shino finally calls all of his Kakechu back into the ground and turns around to look at Tsukino and Higure. Did you learn anything? Tsukino asks as she finally stands up. I did. Shino nods. While it may be faint, this Gashinboku does share certain similarities to the Divine Tree. What? What does that mean for us? Higure asks in an apprehensive tone, not liking the implications this may carry. It's difficult to say. We do know specifically how a divine tree is created, so I doubt this is entirely connected. Biologically speaking, humans and apes also share a connection but are vastly different entities, this could be a similar case. It may simply be a tree that merely happened to absorb some chakra into it long ago, just as we humans did to become shinobi. So it's just a whole lot of speculation. Tsukino concludes. In short, yes. Shino confirms. Does that mean you won't harm the Gashinboku? Higure asks. I certainly hope it won't come to it. There are still tests to be done, of course, and I hope to be able to assist your efforts in revitalizing it. If you're able to, that would be most welcome. Higure exclaims. Do you think you'll be able to? Tsukino looks toward the weakened tree. That's what I intend to find out, but it may take time. We'll give you as much as you need. Tsukino gives a firm nod. Shino turns to the caretaker. Higure sensei, I'd also ask to be given access to your lab, to join in your efforts. But also to clear certain suspicions that he has. Higure looks to Tsukino who gives a confirming smile, before turning his attention back to Shino. Consider it done. He extends a hand. Shino accepts it and shakes the man's hand. Thank you. We're the ones who should be thanking you. Higure smiles. You've been more accepting than we thought the great nations would be. Times are indeed changing. Shino smiles lightly. Then let's call it a day for now. Tsukino motions for the two to follow her out. We can continue first thing in the morning. I'm sure you've exhausted a lot of chakra to command your beetles. It was chakra well spent, I believe. Elsewhere in the hidden moon, Hakui frantically paces around a room that's only furnished with the bare minimum. He circles around a couch, actively avoiding sitting down. He only stops when Shinga and Dashin enter the room. Shingle looks at Hakui's visibly panicked demeanor and raises a brow. Did something happen? The Shinobi Union rep, I ran into him at the Gashinboku. And? Shinga prods for more information, already growing tired. Was it someone you know? I heard it's an Aburama. 
Shino Aburame, yes. I don't know if he recognized me, I'd never met him before, but there's a chance he might know of me. Of us. Shino Aburame. Shinga rubs his chin. Was that Shibi Aburama's son? I forget. Dashin jumps over the backrest and lies down on the sofa. If they become a problem we'll just kill them, right? Easy. Hakui glares at the younger boy from the corner of his eyes. I wouldn't underestimate the leaf if I were you. You've never seen what the Aburama clan can do. Dashin waves off the unwanted warning. But I've seen what the Genin can do and it's nothing of note. If it ever comes to it, I can take them on by myself. Hakui's right. Shinga advises caution. You heard them introduce themselves. The Senju, Saratobi, and Hyuga clans aren't to be underestimated. Yeah, yeah. Dashin doesn't sound convinced. Shinga turns back to Hakui. The chances of you being recognized are low, and Dashin. Non-existent. Myself, on the other hand, if this is indeed Shibi Abu Rama's son and if he's anything at all like his father, he may recognize me. I concur. Hakui nods. It may be best for you to lay low until this shinobi union visit ends. How far along is our plan? All we need is a pure enough quartz from the Kofu mines, and we'll have everything we need. The power of the divine tree is within our grasp. Shinga's lips whiten into a twisted grin. Dashin cackles with glee. They'll never see it coming. I certainly hope you're right. Hakui adds. Back in their apartment, Shino is flipping through a particular booklet. A small pocket book that holds in it information on specific shinobi, their faces, their allegiance, their misdeeds, and most importantly their bounty. Not this one, not this one. Shino mutters to himself as he flips the pages. Wrong face shape, wrong hair. The transformation is unlikely as that would require constant upkeep, and physical changes can only do so much. When he reaches the final page, he shuts the book and places it by his side. He's not in the bingo book so he's not a rogue ninja. So why is he so familiar? When the front door opens and his students chattering fills the apartment, Shino puts the bingo book away and goes to meet them. We're back, Shino-sensei. Kashiwama excitedly announces their return. Did you miss us? He jokes. Shino smiles at his jovial attitude, seems like their first day went well. I did. How did it go? It went well, naturally. Jiriki drops his backpack by the entranceway and makes his way inside. We had to help nearby miners expand the mines. Genzai clarifies. We widened the caverns, made new paths, and stabilized them. Thanks to my earth style. Kashiwama pounds his chest. Thanks to his earth style, yes. Genzai chuckles. The two boys leave their bags as well and head inside with their sensei. Did you work well with Tambo Sujibashi sensei and Hifumi? Shino asks. We did. Kashiwama grins. Tambo sensei is really fun. Jiriki looks back at them over the sofa's headrest. I have to wonder how this village operates, though. They don't follow a set system and seem to just do whatever they please. I do somewhat wonder the same thing. Genzai says, Hifumi is Tambo's only student, so that limits the missions they can take on and the chance of success if something goes wrong. It is indeed very different from how we do things, but the Hidden Moon Village has historically been more peaceful, so they've found a system that works for them. Shino explains. Remember, the Land of Iron and their samurai also follow a different system, but have stayed a force to be reckoned with. You mustn't look down on something different. That's because there's usually a good reason it's different. Yes, sensei. The Genin says in unison. Well I think it sounds pretty great. Kashiwama sits down on the sofa and takes up much more space than one person should, much to Jiriki's annoyance. Genzai shrugs. I suppose as long as we're doing our job. Not much of a job, though. Jiriki complains. We're just doing manual labor like we always have. And in doing so are showing them how good you've become at it. Shino explains. The teamwork you've built and creativity you've nurtured. That's your mission for the duration of our stay. What about your mission, sensei? Kashiwama asks. It going well? It is. Differently than I thought but well. I'm actually going to send a report to inform the Hakage of our initial impressions and findings. So be sure to tell me how it went in greater detail. Leave it to me. Kashiwama pounds his chest. Let's make it a team effort, yeah? Genzai chuckles. After spending a day within the Hidden Moon Village, new information has come to light that needs to be brought to the attention of the Shinobi Union. During the Fourth Great Ninja War, the citizens of the Hidden Moon Village did not fall victim to the effects of the Divine Tree due to the protection of a local tree referred to as Gashinboku, or the Sacred Tree. The Gashinboku sprouted large roots of its own that drained the divine tree and freed anyone who was captured. 
With the aid of the Abu Rama clan Kakechu, I've determined that the roots under the Hidden Moon Village do not contain as much chakra as other roots, meaning that the ones here have not absorbed as much chakra, giving credibility to their recollection of events. After examining the Gashinboku as well, I've determined it to have similarities to the Divine Tree, although their exact relationship remains a secret. The Gashinboku and its sap has been an invaluable resource to the Hidden Moon Village, providing medicine. I'll continue researching. Team 5 was also assigned their first mission to aid a mine in the nearby Kofu town. They proved invaluable to their efforts to expand the mine and open new chambers in search for ores and gemstones. They've built good relations with the team they were assigned to, as well as the local miners. Is that enough? Kashiwama asks as he peeks over Shino's shoulder. It's enough for now. Shino answers. Genzai sits on a nearby chair, remaining oddly tense. Is that tree really related to the divine tree? He speaks up after a bit. It seems to be, yes. Are we in danger? Could what happened six years ago happen again? Genzai asks. Based on my findings so far, I don't believe so. Whatever the Gashinboku is, it doesn't seem to serve the same purpose as the divine tree, so I do think we are not in any danger. But it's still uncertain, right? Jiriki adds his own worries. Come on, guys, the tree's a savior. You heard what Shino-sensei said, it fought against the divine tree. Kashiwama defends it. Maybe because it wanted to eat them itself. Jiriki adds a bit of dark humor. Get rid of the competition. Come on, man, don't say that. Kashiwama lightly taps him across the shoulder. We got no reason not to trust it, and we have reasons to trust it. So it's all good. Jiriki blinks. Your optimism is staggering, but not entirely misplaced. Shino says. While good to be cautious, we must examine it with a level head. Get all the necessary information before we pass judgment. Genzai looks down at his feet, leaning on his legs. I just don't want that to happen again. No one does. Shino gets up from his chair and walks over to Genzai, placing a hand on the young boy's shoulder. I promise if I suspect even for a moment something may be awry, I'll inform you all right away. I won't allow my team to go through that again. For now, do as you have been, and trust in me. Genzai looks up to Shino with a reassured smile. Yes, sensei. Kashiwama walks over and drapes an arm around Genzai's shoulders. Come on, man, let's go watch TV. Yeah, let's. Genzai stands up and the two head for the door. We should train, prepare for our new missions tomorrow. Jiriki interjects. Oh, shush you. Let's have some fun. Kashiwama walks over with his hand still draped on Genzai's shoulder, and the two wedge Jiriki in between them, leading their teammate out with them. It'll be good for you. Genzai chuckles. You're becoming worse by the day, Genzai. Jiriki mumbles as he's let out. Shino smiles at his student's antics, but quickly focuses his attention back to the scroll. He reported the main events that need reporting, but there's still something eating away at him. It's far too early to bring up any concerns without any evidence to back them up. It wouldn't do good to raise alarms when a relationship between the Union and the Moon aren't set in stone just yet. Instead, Shino puts the inkwell back in his supplies kit and takes a different but similar looking one. He takes a moment to think things over and dips his brush. First thing next morning, Shino is taken by Yazara to their own aviary, so he could send the report to the Hidden Leaf. They do look over the contents to make sure all is in order, and see a standard report on the status of the Gashinboku, which they'd already been briefed on, and on Team 5's performance. With nothing amiss, they strap it to a messenger hawk's leg, and send it off to the Hidden Leaf village. Two days later, Hakage's office. Sonata takes a dramatically deep sigh as she looks over the report on her desk, both hands on her head in disbelief. By her side, Shizune, Kakashi, and Shikamaru have an equally befuddled expression. First Naruto runs into trouble immediately upon arrival. And now this. Kakashi laments. It's just one thing after another, isn't it? If this tree truly does share a connection with the divine tree, it could pose a threat. Shikamaru warns. But it protected the shinobi of the hidden moon, didn't it? Shizune adds. It may be the antithesis to the divine tree. Either way, the fact that it's powerful enough to render the divine tree inert is cause for worry. Even if the tree itself is a force for good, its power could be used otherwise in the wrong hands. Kakashi sighs. If this information comes out to the public, there will definitely be some unsavory types who'd want to exploit it. Sonata leans back in her chair and rests her head on her hand. All the more reason for the hidden moon to join the shinobi union so we can work on this together and make sure that doesn't happen. Unfortunately, Yamato will be busy at the Hidden Dream Village for a while longer. 
his particular skill set could have helped. Should we inform the rest of the union? Shikamaru asks. Sonata ponders for a moment, finger tapping on her cheek. Leave it for now. Let Shino get the full picture before we jump into anything. The other leaders won't like that we didn't tell them right away. Shizuna warns. Yes, I'm aware. Sonata gives an exasperated sigh. I'll handle that when it comes. For now, however, I'm somehow more worried about what else Shino has to say. If this is the public report, then what's so important that he had to hide it? The rest look at their Hakage with a quizzical raised brow. What do you mean? Shizuna asks. Sonata simply taps on the scroll. Didn't you notice? The ink Shino used. She pushes the scroll back and flips it around to face the other side of her desk. Ah. Shikamaru finally realizes. We were so absorbed with the Gashinboku. Kakashi sees it now as well. A masked hanbu flickers into the room in front of the desk, pale mask as they all are, red markings surrounding the eye and covering the forehead. The more notable additions to his outfit are a painting brush strapped to his side, along with a vial of black inky liquid. The anbu touches the scroll with two fingers and forms one-handed hand signs. Ninja art. Living ink. The writing on the scroll shifts into an entirely new message. The words rearrange themselves to form the portrait of an androgynous man with long hair and the following text. During my stay I also encountered a man by the name of Hakui, who's responsible for treating the Gashinboku. Visibly between 25 and 30 years of age. Golden blonde hair, approximately 30 centimeters in length. Soft features, pointed chin. Eye shape and color could not be seen. No evidence of such a person was found in the bingo book, however I hold suspicion that he is someone in hiding. I have no concrete evidence of that as of yet. It's only a hunch. Well, that's our odd. Sonata raises a brow. Shino doesn't strike me as someone to throw around baseless accusations. Maybe not. Shikamaru takes a better look at the sketch, but his hunches usually come out right. If he suspects this guy then there's got to be a reason for it. Moreover he kept this hidden from the hidden moon, so he's not shared his suspicions with the village head. Shizuna notes. Well, if our chosen representative has concerns, we ought to look into it. Kakashi says. I'm glad you agree. Kakashi, I leave it to you. Kakashi sighs. Yes ma'am. She then turns to the Anbu in front of her. Sai, I want the Anbu's network on this as well. Sai bows his head, understood, and disappears to perform his newly assigned task. Let's hope it turns out to be nothing. Sonata says. After the hidden dreams incident, I'd rather we not get involved in something like this. Then I'll take my leave. Kakashi bows and heads out the office. I'll see what I can find too. Shikamaru follows shortly after. Sonata groans in exasperation and reaches for the bottommost drawer of her desk to pull out a bottle and two cups. Shizuna crosses her arms and taps her foot. Is this really the time? After everything? Sonata opens the bottle. Yes. Shouldn't we focus our energy on finding out about this Hakui person? And that's why I've assigned people to work on it. Stop being a prune and sit with me, tell me about Aruka and Shahei. I could use some pleasant news for a change. Sonata wiggles a cup at Shizuna. Shizuna stares down her mentor but is ultimately outstared. With a reluctant sigh, she sits down. Just one. She warns. Uh huh. Sure. Sonata laughs, knowing all too well how just one usually goes. Name meanings. Higyur Kuchinashi. Higyur equals twilight, Kuchinashi equals something unspoken. Kakeru, waning of the moon. Trivia. Kofu City, Yamanashi Prefecture is a city in Japan that produced quartz and amethyst. End of chapter 75.